If I have not got the privilege of meeting you, my name is Ben File, and I'm uh, blessed to be able to serve as the student pastor here at First North, and I am uh, blessed and grateful that Pastor Mike asked me to come and open God's Word with you this morning. Um, Before we do that, I want to make you aware of a couple of things. One of them is uh, Converge is next Sunday at 6 p.m. If you don't know what Converge is, that is our um, our Spartanburg-wide um, prayer rally for all of the schools in Spartanburg County. And so we have a big poster out there with all of the different schools um, in Spartanburg County listed. And what we need your help with is we need to have every school covered, um, every person at a school uh, praying for that school. And then we're going to have like a live stream at, uh, at six o'clock and we're going to kind of have a time of prayer together as a church, um, but spread out all throughout the county at the different schools. And so if you have not gotten a chance to sign up for um, the school that you would like to pray for, there's a poster out there um, and we need your help because there are still several schools that have not been covered and it is next week. So you can sign up in the foyer um, for a school. And one of the cool things that we did this year is we actually emailed the principals um, of the schools and asked them for prayer requests. We just asked them, hey, um, is there anything in particular that we can be praying for you about? And we've gotten some responses, and that has been uh, great. And so the schools that we have heard back from about specific prayer requests, you'll notice that they have a star next to their name um, out in the Um, out on the poster. And so we'll want to make sure that um, all of those schools are covered. And then um, one thing uh, that I want to let you know about is that tomorrow, all of District 2's teachers are going to be right here in our building for their convocation. Um, That's a big deal. That's a great um, opportunity for us as the church to be able to love on them and minister to them and just express our gratitude to them um, for all that they do to um, to train the next generation by, you know, by being teachers. And I'm a little bit biased toward uh, teachers because my wife just happens to be one, uh, but they just do such incredible work. And so uh, we're actually going to ask them again tomorrow um, if they have any prayer requests, any of the teachers in District 2, um, to, to let us know about that. And we're just super excited to have them in the building with us tomorrow morning. And then I'll just let you know about one more thing. Uh, and this is in your bulletin and it has been for a few weeks now, but, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll plug this since I'm, uh, the student pastor, but in, um, in a few weeks on August 27th, we are having something here called a one night. And what that is, is churches from all over Spartanburg and even some from outside of Spartanburg um, are gathering here at our church um, in our parking lot. It's kind of like fireworks at first and that, you know, we're going to have food and we're going to have inflatables and games and lots of stuff. Um, But it's all students. It's youth groups coming to our church. And for a couple hours, we're going to have some food and fun, and it's going to be all free to um, the students. But then around six o'clock or so, we're going to come in here um, and have a time of worship together. Um, We're bringing in a speaker, um, and this is a huge outreach opportunity for us and for our students to invite their friends and all of that. Um, And, you know, as we've kind of tallied up all of the the youth groups that are coming and then thought about the potential of them bringing friends. We're hoping to have over a thousand students right here in this sanctuary, grades six through 12th grade, um, who are going to hear the word of God preached and proclaimed. Um, and so we just want to ask that you be praying for that. Um, that's going to be a, a huge event for us. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about it um, in the days to come. But I just want to um, explain that to you. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We are going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 9, we, um, a couple weeks ago, you may not have been aware of this, um, but about two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago today, pretty much our entire high school, um, almost all of our high school students were down at Garden City Chapel um, in Myrtle Beach on our senior high beach camp. Um, And one of the things that we talked about, it was really the um, central idea of the weekend, is what does it mean to actually be a follower of Jesus Christ? And so this is one of the the passages that we walked through. We walked through um, some places in Luke chapter 9 and and Luke chapter 10 because Jesus talks all about this. Um, He talks about what does it mean to actually be a disciple? 
And so we saw God do some incredible things that weekend. Students were honest about things that they had been uh, struggling with. Several of them made um, decisions in their relationship with Christ about ways that they needed to move forward, um, some things that they needed to leave behind. Um, recruiting some brothers and sisters to help them um, in their walk with Christ. And so this morning, I want to give you a little bit of a taste um, of what God has been doing in our high school ministry um, in particular. But it's, it's a word for all of us because it's God's word, right? And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning. And I want to read verses 18 through 27. So let's read this together. You can follow along. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me, and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you and we're grateful for who you are and for your word. Thank you for the ways that you speak to us and you lead us and you guide us. And Lord, thank you that whenever we open your word, we can confidently be assured that you are the one who is speaking to us because every word of scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for us. And so, Lord, I pray that in this time, as we open your word, would your Holy Spirit just stir in us, stir up our affections for Jesus Christ, for those in this room who have not given their life to you. Lord, would today be the day that you awaken them to faith in you. And Lord, for all of the saints in the room, I pray that you would stir up our affection for Jesus Christ in such a way that because of our love for you and because of how we realize how much you love us, and the claim that you have on our lives because you are our Lord, that we would move forward with you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we echo the prayer of the prophet Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So uh, Luke chapter 9, Jesus is talking about um, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Now, whenever I use that word follower, um, you know, what, what does your mind immediately go to? You know, it may go toward, okay, somebody who quite literally follows around another person. Um, one of the popular ways that this term is, is used, especially um, in the, the younger generation, is it has to do with social media. You are a follower of somebody on social media. It means you can see their updates. You can see their posts. Um, if you follow somebody, you can you know, more easily communicate with them. You see what's going on. If they follow you, then that means that they can see um, what you're up to. But what comes to your mind when you think of a follower. What does it mean to follow somebody? And we're going to see that following Jesus is not like just following after somebody, just walking around with them, or even clicking follow on, on your phone or on social media. Because following Jesus actually costs us something, but following Jesus in return actually gives us something, and that's life. It's true and everlasting life. And so I want to go ahead and give you the main point for this morning. We're going to pull several things from this text, but what is the overarching point of this set of verses? And here's the, the first thing on your outline. Followers of Jesus answered the call to discipleship by dying to themselves daily and receiving life from Jesus Christ. That's the overarching point. Maybe a mouthful, but that's the, the, the main point of what we're going to see in our text this morning. So let's go back. And let's just walk straight through it. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Now it happened 
that as he was praying alone, this is Jesus here, <clears throat> the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Okay, so um, Jesus is praying, he's with his disciples, and then he, he just asks them, who, who do people say that I am? Because if you read in the Gospel of Luke up to this point, he's been doing all kinds of miracles, he's been teaching with power and authority, and the people are like, who in the world is this guy? And so Jesus asks the disciples, you know what, what are people saying about me? Who do people think that I am? What's the word on the street about me? <laughs> who are people saying that I am? And the disciples say, well, some people think you're John the Baptist, um, raised from the dead, right? If you, if you see that um, back in earlier in Luke chapter 9, you actually see Herod the Tetrarch, the, the, the one who put John the Baptist to death. He hears about Jesus and he, he thinks that it is John the Baptist raised from the dead, right? So that's one option. Okay, you could be John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah or that um, one of the prophets of old has been resurrected. And that was another um, theory that people had about him. Again, if you read through the, the Gospel of Luke, you'll see some people say, it's almost like one of the prophets of old has, has risen, right? Because these are things that only the Old Testament prophets were doing. He's performing all these miracles. He's teaching with power, bringing God's word in an authoritative way. This is just like what the prophets were doing. But then Jesus makes this question very personal in verse 20. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Now, Peter got the answer right, said the Christ of God. Now, the word Christ, um, it comes from the Greek word Christos, which all that is, is that is the Greek word for the Hebrew uh, Mashiach or Messiah. So the word uh, Messiah and Christ, they mean the same thing. It's just two different languages. And so Peter is saying, you are the Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for, the one that Moses wrote about, and all of the prophets have written about, and David, and all of these different people, you are the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one who's going to come and set us free. You're the one who's going to come and establish the kingdom of God. So he gets the answer right, but I want us to look closely at Jesus' question. Who do you say that I am? And we, we kind of miss this in, in our English Bibles here, but in the, in the Greek, the word you is emphasized. Who do you say that I am? You, he, you hear the, the power behind that? Who do you say that I am? And so here's the next thing on your outline to write down. Every one of us must answer Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Every one of us. And every one of us does answer that question. You ever thought about that before? Every person on this earth is answering this question, who is Jesus? Right? And I love how um, C.S. Lewis actually gives, he really kind of gives us three options here as far as um, how we are uh, thinking about Jesus. He's either one of three things, okay? He's either a liar, right? He's just made all this stuff up. He's doing all this stuff, and he's preaching a, a cool message, and he's really persuading a lot of people, but he's a liar. Right? He's a fake. He's a phony. So he's either a liar, in which case we shouldn't listen to him, or he is a lunatic. Right? This guy's out of his mind. Who in the world does he think he is claiming to be equal with, with God, claiming to be God the Son incarnate, second person of the Godhead that we just sang about and how great is our God, right? The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son. Who in the world does he claim to be being the second person of the Trinity? This guy's out of his mind. So he's either a liar or a lunatic, in which case we shouldn't listen to him, or he's Lord. He's God. And if he is Lord, then nothing else matters. If Jesus Christ is Lord and God and is exactly who he said he was and actually was raised from the dead, then nothing else matters. In fact, every one of his words and every one of his actions matters immensely. And so I want to ask you this question. How are you answering Jesus' question in your own life? Who do you say that I am? How are you answering that question? Again, we just established, if Jesus is anything other than Lord, 
And there are a lot of answers in our culture today about what Jesus is or who Jesus is. He's a great prophet. He's a great teacher. Um, I even heard somebody say one time, Jesus was a great Christian prophet. I'm like, well, yes, but he's, <laughs> he's way more than that, right? He, he was actually God incarnate. Okay, that kind of misses the point. But there are a lot of ideas out there about who Jesus is. And if he is anything other than Lord, then we shouldn't take him seriously. But if he is Lord, everything matters that he said and did. So how are you answering this question in your own life? Who do you say that Jesus is? And listen, maybe you are not a follower of Jesus here. And you haven't come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. Because when you really come to that conclusion, and you understand what that means, then there's nothing else we can do but follow him. So how are you answering this question in your own life? Let's move on to verse 21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now this is kind of strange, isn't it? Peter just gives the right answer about Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Well, you're the Christ of God. You're the Messiah, the one sent from God that we've been waiting for. And then Jesus says, don't tell anybody that. Why in the world is that? Right? Doesn't Jesus want the word about him, his actual identity to go out throughout the world? Right? We're all called to make disciples of all nations. But at this point in Jesus's ministry, he was trying to avoid the wrong kind of popularity. Because if, if he was just becoming the most famous man on the earth just because of the things he was doing, and people were identifying him as the Messiah, there was this idea about the Messiah at this time that he was going to come in riding victoriously on a horse, and he was going to overthrow whatever empire, um, whatever kingdom had set itself up over the people of God, over the people of Israel. And at this time, it was Rome. And so Jesus didn't want people to have the idea that he was coming as an earthly king to set up his kingdom and overthrow the Roman Empire. He was not going to do that in this coming. Notice it's this coming. In the second coming, he's coming to establish his kingdom forever. He's coming with a, a sword sticking out of his mouth, Revelation says. He's on a war horse. He's got a tattoo on his thigh, right? Jesus means business when he comes back. But that's not this coming, right? And what does he say? He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. That's why I've come, Jesus says. I need to be rejected and suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And then Jesus says this in verse 23. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you've got to die. And so that's Jesus's call. Here's the next thing in your outline. Jesus's call is this, come and die. Come and die. Now that sounds pretty severe, doesn't it? Why die? I thought that Jesus was, was this super happy guy who just came to give us life. Well, he did come to give us life, but why die? Why is he emphasizing that we die to ourselves here? Well, Jesus actually provides the answer in the previous verse. Look back to verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and die and be raised from the dead. And then verse 23 says, you want to come with me? Do you want to come with me? you got to pick up your cross too. Now, obviously, Jesus picked up his cross in a way that was unique, right? He was paying for the sins of, of any of us who would believe and, and give our lives to him in repentance and faith. So Jesus walked a trail that you and I are not capable of walking in the sense of he actually took the punishment for our sins. But 1 Peter 2 does say that Jesus has gone this road before us and has left us an example that we would walk in his steps. And so Jesus says, you want to come after me? You want to follow me? You got to die. And that's where true life is found. What does he say in verse 24? 
that whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, right? We'll find true life. So you find true life when you give up control of your life to Jesus. And I mean your entire life. I don't mean at one point in your life you said yes when somebody said, do you want to be saved? But I mean every day, that 1% of your life that you don't want anybody else to know about. Are you surrendering that to Jesus and saying, Lord, you be the Lord over every area of my life? So what does it mean for us to die to ourselves? What does that mean? Well, there are two different ways that we die to ourselves. This is in your outline. The first one is surrendering my life to Jesus and receiving forgiveness for my sin. That's conversion. That's the moment when um, the gospel is proclaimed, and who knows how many times it took you hearing the gospel before the Holy Spirit awakens your heart, right? But you hear the gospel, you are convicted of your sins, You give your life to Christ by turning from your sin and trusting in what Christ did for you in his death and resurrection. And in that moment, God forgives you. He adopts you as a son or daughter. He puts his Holy Spirit within you and you are saved once and for all. That's your conversion. And that's the first way that you die to yourself. And if you're not a believer this morning, this is what's offered to you. Life, eternal and everlasting from the God who loves you, who created you, and calls you to be a follower of Jesus. But then the second way that we die to ourselves is this, surrendering every part of my life to Jesus every day in community with other believers. This is discipleship. You ever wonder what what the term discipleship means, right? We, We use that word a lot, it's a real churchy word. Discipleship, it means, man, for all of my life, I am surrendering all of my life to Jesus. So that means that, man, I am discovering every day areas of my life that are not submitted to the lordship of Jesus. And so guess what? I'm not flourishing. I'm not flourishing in that area. And the Holy Spirit is gracious enough to illuminate those things in my life. And what it means to actually die to yourself is to give up control of that. And ask Jesus to be Lord over that and fiercely submit it to him, right? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you do this with other believers. There is no such thing as doing this life alone. That's why we gather every Sunday. That's why we need each other. That's why it's so important that we are physically here. It's because we need to do life together. Church is not a program to be watched from a distance. It is the family of God that you have been called into. And so that's why we need to link arms with brothers and sisters, link shields with each other, because guess what? If we're standing shield to shield together and you fall down, then guess what? I'm exposed. And if I fall, you're exposed. And we need each other. And that's why this is so important. Jesus calls us to come and die. And here's another thing. And I I love you, and I'm too afraid of God to not say this, but the Bible knows nothing of you believing in Jesus and having no intention of ever following or submitting to him. That is not Christianity. Now, there's a wide misconception out there that if you make a decision at one point in your life, or you get baptized, or you sign the card, or you shake the right person's hand, then you're good, man. You got the fire insurance. Go live. Go go live it up, right? Eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is not Christianity. What marks true disciples of Jesus is not making a decision at one point in my life and then continuing to do what I want. The Bible is actually very um, clear and very brutally honest about this, that you're actually saved from doing what you want because Scripture teaches that what we want leads us away from Christ and into sin. That's why God puts his Holy Spirit within us to constantly, every day, help us die to ourselves and to conform us into the image of his son, right? That's why the Holy Spirit is within you. And what are the things that we want? What are these things that lead us astray? What are these idols in our lives? One of them is approval. Oh my gosh, how much time and energy we spend trying to gain the approval of other people 
whose opinion of us just really, if we consider it for a second, it doesn't matter. Are you, there may be people you don't even know, but you want to look the part, you want to dress the part, I want to drive the right car, I want to have the nicest house so that people think I've got it together. Or I want to be surrounded and seen by the right people, or with the right people. We're so consumed with approval, another one is power or control. Man, that the second that something is outside of our control, what is our inclination? To immediately fix it, to immediately have control of that or comfort. Man, the second you or I get uncomfortable, what's our inclination? I got to fix that immediately because I can't have any discomfort in my life. And these idols, these things, they enslave us, they destroy us. And so many of us, if we're just honest for a second, we get so caught up in these things. Maybe you are right now, but Jesus, gosh, he's so gracious and so loving that he comes to us and he tells us, listen, die to yourself and turn away from this in repentance. Give me control. Let me be Lord in that area of your life because I love you, and I want you to follow me, and I want you to flourish. And notice in verse 23, how often does Jesus call us to die to ourselves? In verse 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Picking up the cross, which actually, I mean, if you think about it within this context, that was, a, that was an instrument of torture. Jesus is saying, pick up your instrument of your death, and come follow me. So picking up the cross, dying to ourselves, submitting ourselves to the lordship of Jesus is a daily, lifelong pursuit. And guess what? Nobody has arrived. Nobody has made it except those whom God has called on to glory before us. God is so good and so gracious with us and so patient that guess what? Whenever we get to the end of our lives, he just says, all right, that's enough. And he calls us home and boom, just like that, we're with the Lord. And if we're honest, and this is a hard truth, but growing as a follower of Jesus is excruciatingly slow, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Man, how many of us, we're just like, man, I, and I'll be the first to tell you, I am so not where I want to be and not where I wanted to be years ago, right? I mean, if we're honest about that, growing is so slow, isn't it? I really hope to be way further along than I am right now. But here's the deal. Sanctification, which that big word, what that means is um, your lifelong growth where the Holy Spirit gradually conforms you into the image of Christ. Your sanctification, your growing as a follower of Jesus is slow and it's dirty. It's sometimes painful and often it looks like nothing is happening. If you look at yourself from a week ago, guess what? You may not see much of a difference, but if we're honest, if we look at ourselves five years ago or 10 years ago, we can see, oh my gosh, Lord, you've worked in my life. You've helped me. You've given me strength. You helped me overcome that. You've helped me resist this. You've given me victory in this. You've grown me in this. And if you look back in your life five, ten years ago, and you don't see anything different, then I want to ask you to seriously question whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. Because according to the Bible, God's Holy Spirit lives within His people, and God does not leave His people alone. So are you growing? But that's how God makes us more like His Son. So do you feel frustrated in your walk with Christ? Do you sometimes feel like nothing is happening? Or that God does not see your faithfulness in the little things, the things that seem like they don't matter? Well, guess what? He does. Or listen, maybe you've been dying to yourself a lot um, late, lately, right? You've been, you've been dying to yourself and you're just trying and you still feel like nothing is happening. Take heart. Or maybe you're not there and you're coming to realize this morning you've been drifting from the Lord and you need to come back. You need to get on the road with him. You need to pick up the cross because it's been set down for a while. You need to move forward with Jesus. Wherever you're at right now, Jesus' invitation is the same to all of us. Come to me, die to yourself, and you'll receive true life. Here's the last thing. Actually, let me read the verses first, and then I'll give you the last thing in your outline. Verse 25, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
and loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Here's the last thing in your outline. Having everything except Jesus cannot substitute for having Jesus Christ as my Lord. If I have everything else, but I don't have Jesus, then guess what? I don't have life. And that's what he says in verse 25. What does it profit a man? What does it benefit you if you gain the whole world and lose yourself, lose your soul? Right? What does the whole world entail? Well, it entails the whole world or anything and everything that you've ever wanted or you could ever see yourself wanting. You get all of that, but you don't have God, then guess what? You are bankrupt. You are poor because you don't have the Spirit of God living within you. And I want to point this out to you, and we're getting ready to land the plane here. Jesus sees discipleship as a shift of allegiance. Maybe you never thought about this before, but when you become a Christian, your allegiance is actually given to God and not to other things, not to yourself anymore. I'm not the God of my own life because if we're all honest, listen, we make really terrible gods. I don't know about you, I mean, I'm a horrible Lord of my life. I I screw it up if I try to do it. And you will too. And spending your time and your energy and even your money on things that only this world can, can give you, right? Popularity, affirmation, identity, someone who's going to love you, someone who's going to value you, comfort, approval, sex, people to like you, right? All of these different things making these things your Lord rather than Christ? According to Jesus here, it shows where your true allegiance is. And he has called us, listen, submit to me, because I'm the only one who will give you life. And that's why the Bible spends so much time calling God's people. Remember this, Put all of these things away from you. You ever noticed that that is not, those are by and large not addresses to unbelievers to put away bad things in their lives? That is Paul and the apostles preaching to the church. And why is that? Because it's a daily battle to die to ourselves and to let Jesus be Lord even in that 1% of our life that we don't want others to know about. I want to read verse 26 again, and then we'll be done. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This is one of those verses that makes us really uncomfortable. And there's a reason for that, because it's through the warnings that you and I are preserved, right? But what does it mean to be ashamed of something. What does it mean to be ashamed of Jesus? To reject him privately and publicly, to refuse to confess him as Lord of your life to other people. Listen, I was um, in a conversation with my neighbor yesterday that I've been feeling convicted that I need to share the gospel with him. And I finally, I, I, not that I didn't have the opportunity before, but I actually took advantage of the opportunity yesterday talking to him about Christianity. And that's a really uncomfortable thing, right? But I had in the back of my mind, I want to be more afraid of God than I am of this guy. And we had a really nice conversation, actually. But rejecting Jesus before other people, or maybe not wanting them to know that Jesus is the Lord of your life, because guess what? What is that going to mean for you? What are they going to think? Listen, when we're proud of something, we want everybody to know about it. That great restaurant we ate at, man, I want to tell all my friends about it. They need to go to that because it's great. And then the things that we're ashamed of, what do we not want people to do? Find out about it. What's the exact same with Jesus? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. And that's weighty. And it's supposed to be. Because Christianity is not just making a decision at one point in your life and then moving on. It is aggressively submitting to the lordship of Jesus in every area of your life because you love him and because I want him to make me more like his son because it's only in Jesus that you or I have life and life to the full. And so if we're being honest, 
Are there other things that we're cherishing more than Christ? Are there things in your life that have just have kind of knocked Jesus off the throne of your heart and they're sitting there, whether it's approval or comfort or that thing or that person, that status, whatever it may be? Is there anything that you are cherishing more than Christ? Do you want other people to know that Jesus is Lord and that He's the Lord of your life and that you're willing to take any risk of being embarrassed for people to know about that? What we're going to do now is I'm going to pray. We're just going to have a, just a, a very brief time of invitation because I know it's time to, time to go to Bible Fellowship here in just a minute. And I would encourage you to... to Stay here and not miss this. But I'm going to pray. And whatever you need to do with the Lord right now, whatever step you need to take, whether you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then the way that you need to respond and that God calls you to respond is to turn from your sin and trust in Christ and what he did for you in his death and resurrection. But if you are a saint, you are a Christian in here, what is God saying to you right now? What do you need to do about it? And would you do that here before we go to Bible fellowship? Because listen, if we're honest, if we won't do it now in the safest place where we can be honest with the Lord, there's not much hope that we're going to do it anywhere else. So what do you need to do with God right now in order to cherish Him above all things? Because that's what it comes down to. Are you cherishing Christ above all things? Because if you do, everything else follows.